I am from University of Oregon and um, was asked to give you a little bit of information to start off the day to talk about kind of prevalence. So what are we seeing in terms of rates of substance use across substances, specifically in the tri-counties area up here in, in the por greater Portland metro area. So that is, that's sort of my, my charge. Uh, I, I don't have any disclosures to, to share. Um, what I wanted to start off with, Joe, though, is just giving a few slides, a little bit of information about the University of Oregon Center on Parenting and Opioids. Um, that's, I think, in part why I was invited to be here, and it gives a little context for some of the, the work that I'll be presenting this morning. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on the Student Health Survey using Fall 2022 data, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But be prepared to be overwhelmed by some graphs and data, and I just want to reassure everybody that all of that is in the base camp, and so you're going to see a whole lot of charts, um, and then I'll try to summarize and get some key take-home points, but if you want to go back and dive into the data, it's all in the base camp, so you, I, I know it's going to be a big, a heavy, uh, heavy on visuals and data here for, for the first kind of 30 minutes of the day. Um, I'll have another little bit of focus specifically on a few underserved groups, uh, including American Indian, Alaskan Native, youth in foster care, and youth without stable housing, um, and then transition into service gaps, and then a little bit on medication-assisted treatment, although uh, we did that, that overview this morning was covered some of my points, so we might be able to go a little faster there. So to start off, the Center on Parenting and Opioids. Um, this is housed at the University of Oregon. We are funded by the National Institutes of Health to develop, sort of, a, be a national resource for information on parenting in the context of opioid use. And so our goal is really to identify, like it says here, kind of what's going on in the brain. What are the brain pathways? What are the parenting behaviors that are related to both opioid use and parenting? And hopefully by, if we can better identify sort of some of these connections between behaviors and brain pathways around parenting, we can be able to build more personalized prevention programs for families who are affected by opioids and substance use more broadly um, and help them feel more successful and confident in parents. So it, it is a very family-focused, parenting-focused um, model and uh, charge, but I think has a lot of uh, impact in relationship to use substance use disorder as well because uh, parents have kids and kids become youth and adolescents and then become parents again themselves. So the foundation for our center and some of our findings, we do know that substance use disorder, substance misuse tends to run in families. That doesn't, doesn't always, that isn't always the case, but it's more likely if you have extended family who have uh, substance misuse that others in that family will as well. Um, and I think the key impetus for our center is that we know that some of the same things that affect or maybe increase likelihood for substance misuse are, can also impair a person's parenting ability. So um, when we are able to help people be better at regulating their emotions, we might have effective strategies not only for reducing substance misuse, but for being better at interacting with especially uh, little kids. Same with in, impulse control um, and developing effective stress management strategies. So we sort of saw this intersection between the kinds of things that might put a person at risk for substance misuse and the kind of the things that if we can target them might also help parents be very responsive, engaged with their children, especially in that zero to five uh, age range when, they're, when their children are very little. And we also know from some of our work so far that when we do this kind of parenting intervention, uh, we can be effective in disrupting this intergenerational cycle of substance misuse. Uh, and then I'll just also throw in here that, you know, I think we're just very strong advocates for prevention, that the, the more we can do, the earlier we can do to prevent uh, uh, misuse and pathways to, to, to uh, more di uh, different types of substances, uh, the more effective we can be in the long term. So that's sort of the basis of our center. We have, we're sort of uh, guided by a community and professional advisory board of 14 members who come from various community agencies, persons with lived experiences who are guiding the work uh, and activities of our center. Then we have a, three research projects, two of which have parenting intervention components, 
13 pilot studies, those are meant to be led by earlier career scholars um, that can help us you know, gain new insights into something that we could then maybe do something larger to tackle in the future. We do hold free monthly webinars that also offer continuing education uh, credits, quarterly newsletters, and, um, and then we have a data collective to en engage people with lived experiences in substance use and parenting. So that's a essentially um, a way to reach out to folks who are in substance use treatment facilities and invite them to be part of the research activities and they're compensated for their, their involvement. If you are interested in being on our newsletter, I think the very first slide had a link that tells you how to join. So that'll, that's in the base camp slides. These are our very high, uh, you know, lofty goals. I think if we could make a teeny dent on any of these, we'd be very happy. But just uh, kind of to give you a sense of our larger vision, we really are aimed at sort of this reducing multi-generational substance abuse and um, but also increasing kind of the public understanding of the harms of substance use, not only for that individual, but for the family and for children and for the next generation. So with that backdrop, I think that was why I was invited here today to talk a little bit more about sort of this epidemiology or, or the rates, what's going on in our communities um, in terms of use, substance use. use. And I'm going to mostly rely on, that's actually slightly adjacent to my core area, so I relied pretty heavily on the Student Health Survey for Oregon. How many of you, can, can I get a show of hands, how many folks are familiar with that survey? Okay, so maybe a quarter of you or so. Um, there's a ton of information in there, so I've tried to distill just the things that are uh, most relevant here. So. Basically, the, the way this worked is that it was open to school districts throughout the state of Oregon, and parents and students were notified and given the option to opt out. Then um, this targeted specifically 6th, 8th, and 11th graders, and they were the data I'm going to show today were between, were really fall 2022, so September, a year ago, essentially, all the way through January of 2023. So they're pretty recent, which is uh, honestly kind of rare for data. We usually are showing data that's like two, three, four, or pre-pandemic years old. So um, I think that's informative. Um, and then it was just done online during a, a class period. So um, the sample, and this is, there's a, some big caveats here in the sample. Not only did families have the, or your parents and youth had the opportunity to opt out, schools did as well. And so I just want to note, when you're looking at these slides, to take into account that the, port, the PPS, Portland Public School, and David Douglas School District did decline to administer the survey. So the data you're seeing here for Multnomah does not include those school districts. So that is not a small caveat. <laughs> um, and you all know the region a little better than I do to know um, how generalizable the other school districts would be to the to, to larger Multnomah County region. Um, Let's see, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview. You're generally gonna see this kind of style where you're, you'll, if the question was asked of sixth graders, which not all questions were, you'll see sixth grade data and then eighth grade data and then 11th grade data. Um, and you will also see the county, the count, the regions and the state organized this way, where it'll be Multnomah, Clackamas, Washington, and then the whole state of Oregon. This one is just the numbers, um, that's why Obviously, the state looks so much larger than the Tri-Counties area. Um, but you can see there are some Multnomah. There were, you know, six kind of dropped down to 942 youth in 11th grade and around 1,500, 1,600 in 6th and 8th grade, et cetera. Again, these numbers or charts are all in the base camp. So I would recommend maybe just kind of looking at the trends and I'll try to call out the important details as we go through. All right. So if anyone has connections to the leaders of Portland Public Schools and Doug David Douglas and can encourage them to participate next time, that would be awesome. Uh, so I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna go through alcohol, uh, cannabis, tobacco, opioids, and then other, other illicit drugs in that order. And so here, and each one will start with sort of just kind of this basic question of use, again, awesome across sixth grade, eighth grade, 11th grade, if it was asked. Uh, so this is just a percent of students who had at least one drink in the past 30 days. 
you know, the obvious trend, as you would see, is as you get into 11th grade, the rates go up. But really, even at 11th grade, um, you know, 10 to 20 percent, depending on the, the region, uh, with Clackamas showing a little bit quite higher rates than some of the other counties and higher than the state overall. I don't know if that resonates with any of you who are working in Clackamas. Yeah, I see some head nods. Uh, you'll see that pattern throughout some of the other slides. Uh, binge drinking, that was defined as five or more drinks in a short period of time. Um, honestly, fairly low. That was not asked of sixth graders because of the low rates. Uh, pretty even here, again, with Clackamas a little bit higher than uh, the other regions and higher than the state. These, re these rates are basically between 5 and 7% of youth indicating in the past 30 days binge, binge drinking. So then, and you'll see this on some of the slides, we sort of wanted to get this harm reduction uh, angle. So how much did, did, did the youth think that people would risk harming themselves if they binge drank drank to one to two times per week? Um, and here, I thought this was pretty useful. You do see, so the darker colors indicate the, the higher risk. Uh, and so you see, as they're getting older, you're, we, we're doing a good job of educating our, our older youth that they are seeing binge drinking as much more harmful than, for example, the sixth or eighth graders. So the older they get, the more they are reporting that binge drinking is harmful. So we've, uh, who, not sure if that's some of you all or others, but we've done a pretty good job of educating youth that binge drinking is harmful. Um, and our, but we have an opportunity now to start that education a little bit younger. The sixth graders aren't reporting that as much. How difficult would it be to get beer, wine, hard liquor? Um, not too difficult by 11th graders. More than half say it would be very easy or sort of easy. That's probably not too much of a surprise. I'm going to shift over to marijuana use. Uh, here again, the rates, on, they're actually very similar to the, uh, the alcohol use rate. So by 11th grade, you know, trend, as you get older, more use. By 11th grade, you sort of have, you know, 10-ish percent, Clackamas County being higher than the other regions. Uh, how are they using, in general, the, uh, smoking and vaping are the most prevalent uses, and then dabbing is also pretty high. And you don't don't see much of an age difference there. This is, again, just the 8th and 11th graders. Um, here's this harm question. How much would people think they risk them harming themselves if they use marijuana regularly? So here I thought you see a pretty interesting reversal of trends. What you see is that younger 6th graders and even 8th graders are seeing that as moderate to great risk, whereas when you get to 11th graders, they're seeing regular use of marijuana as uh, less, uh, uh, more of a slight risk. So we have the, the reverse pattern here than we did for alcohol. How difficult to get marijuana? Not too difficult, about the same, uh, about as similar as it is difficult to get alcohol. You, alcohol. And now I'll switch to, I'll jump over to tobacco. Uh, very similar numbers, about the same, you're seeing the same quarter, it's 10 to 15% of youth, higher in Clackamas. And most are, so the, the large green area there is e-cigarettes or other vaping. Someone asked the first tobacco product used at 10. I, I do not imagine this is a surprise to anyone in this room, is tending to be e-cigarettes or other vaping products. How difficult to get? Uh, I, I thought this was a little bit interesting too. Cigarettes are much hard, more difficult to get than alcohol or marijuana. I don't know that I would have necessarily predicted that, um, but that's what they are reporting. And then how difficult to get vaping products? Uh, not, so di not as difficult. So now we're back to the same kind of trend as alcohol and marijuana. So hard to get cigarettes, not so hard to get alcohol, marijuana, or vaping products. Um, and then uh, we, I pulled data just specifically on flavored tobacco, vaping products, in part uh, because of some of the legislation that's uh, pertinent to this area. And I don't know how many folks are familiar with that. But basically, of those who were um, reported Use, 75% of them who had smoked use a flavored tobacco or vaping product in the last month. 
And so it does sound like there is some statewide legislation right now underway to be considered to have a statewide ban. Um, and it does sound like Washington County had a ban, which was overturned and uh, re then reported that the state had to make the authority. So, and Multnomah County also had a ban. There's a typo that it's supposed to go in effect in 2024. So if that doesn't get overturned, it does sound like Multnomah County will have a ban on flavored, uh, but everyone else is waiting for to see if there is uh, statewide guidance legislation. Okay, how do they get tobacco? Uh, the key thing here is that most are getting their products from family and um, family and friends who are under age 21. So young, young people are sharing their products with other young people. Uh, here's that harm avoidance question. How much um, would smoking a one or more packs of cigarette per day harm your health? Here we get the highest indicators of moderate to great risk. Again, that's the darker circles. So uh, increase, as you get older, more people think it's very harmful and um, smoking is, it. youth perceive smoking is more harmful to your health than most of the other substances. Uh, vaping on the other hand, actually, yeah, vaping also perceived as harmful. So even though they're engaging in it more, it's still perceived as by youth as potentially harmful to their health. So I think that again is another potential opportunity for intervention prevention is that they cognitively, the youth are seeing vaping as potentially harmful to health and yet they're continuing to engage in it and share with their friends. So it could be an avenue for in prevention. Uh, I have one slide in here on uh, menthol cigarette use, in part because of the greater prevalence of and uh, of that in Black and African American youth and adults, and the rates are quite low in Oregon. Less than two percent of eleventh graders are reporting smoking menthol cigarettes, and that could, in part, be reflective of our our fairly non lack of diversity in our area compared to other regions. You don't see this kind of data in other states. You see much higher use. All right, I'm going to shift now to prescription drug misuse. So this was so off label use. So specifically percent of students who reported using prescription or opioids, but not as prescribed in the last 30 days. Um, I was pleasantly just surprised to see that these rates were quite low, so 1%-ish, and really no age trends, so very, very low rates, self-reported of opioid misuse by 6th, 11th, and 8th graders. Um, here's our harm avoidance question, how much would it be a risk, uh, and uh, opioid misuse Prescription misuse is seen as very risky to, to youth in the Tri-County areas. On uh, how difficult to get off-label, you know, misuse prescription drugs, get somebody else's prescription drugs. Um, and that also is evaluated as fairly difficult to, to obtain access to. All right, here's our la the last set of pie charts and bar charts you're going to see for a little bit are around other drug use. Um, this was percent of students using any illicit, any illicit drugs in the last 30 days, uh, also fairly low, one to 2%. And the kind of, it was specifically, they gave some examples in this question they listed, which could have influenced uh, responses. They listed specifically cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, shrooms, heroin, and then they also did list fentanyl or meth. So those were... Sometimes when you list specific drugs, it can affect responses. So in, I just want to give a few take home points there from all of those, the bar and, and, and charts. But in general, not, un, not unexpected. What we see is that regardless of the substance type, possible exception of prescription misuse, um, it, use is going to increase with age. We also see that you know, around 10 to 20 percent of 11th graders have used, have report using, uh, tried alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, um, and but only one to two percent have reported using illicit drugs or prescription misuse. Again, I should say I shouldn't just say use. Those are all like kind of within the last 30 days. So 
that little snippet of a one month window. Youth are generally reporting it's pretty easy to get alcohol, marijuana, vaping products, but not easy to get cigarettes or illicit drugs. Uh, it's possible that 11th graders use is, is higher, more prevalent in Clackamas than particularly Washington, possibly Multnomah, although again, that I do, uh, those data are not comprehensive given the, the school districts that opted out. Um, and then this, this finding that I talked a little about that older youth are seeing binge drinking as generally harmful, but not seeing uh, marijuana use as particularly harmful. And the reverse is true for younger youth. So you have this switch somewhere between kind of eighth and 11th grade where uh, youth are, are shifting from, from thinking um, that marijuana use is harmful to thinking, okay, maybe it's not so harmful and shifting from thinking that alcohol use is not harmful to thinking, okay, yeah, it is, it is harmful to health. Um, but tobacco was seen as harmful by all youth. Um, and then lastly, friends and family under 21 seem to be the most common source of substances. Again, that's probably no, not a surprise to most of you in this room that youth are, are obtaining substances from their peers and from youth slightly older, but generally folks who legally shouldn't have access to those uh, substances. And I think there might be a question. I'm Ayo Enrique, I work at Fora Health. I used to work at other places in the Portland metro area. Um, and I'm curious if we have any demographic breakdown of the data, um, like by race, by gender identity, for the local information. Yeah, there, well, what you have is the gender identity and race ethnicity for the whole sample. But I don't think they broke it down within each of the questions. So you can get kind of who and is it's fairly representative of those counties in terms of the demographics so mostly non hispanic non latinx white i'm curious how skewed you think the data would have gotten based on it being asked in a school where they think maybe it's being tracked by teachers etc yeah that's a great question i do think the way that they did it by having it be online is a little bit better but a better methodology would have been to give them a, a link and let them do it on the street or in their home <laughs> on their phone, um, we probably would have gotten potentially higher endorsement rates. Yeah, I was curious if there was any sort of definition or clarity provided around the self-harming within the survey or if any follow-up was made to determine exactly what the self-harming they were yeah. indicating. No, there was, I, I couldn't see who had, who had, okay, there you are. Um, there was not, it was just exactly as worded here. So it was for them to, interpret what that would mean. The links to the, I think at the very end of the slides on base camp two, I have like the links to the full reports where they're like, they're really long uh, for you, but you can download it for any county in Oregon. So if you're interested in something other than these three counties too, those are available and there's t tons more data than I just presented here and there, but there's a, um, you'll be able to find those if you want, if you go to the last slides in base camp, you can click on those links. Okay. I'm going to, Move to the next little bit here. Just a couple, there are many populations that are underserved in our state, in Tri-Counties. These are gonna be, these are national data now. They are not specific to Oregon or Tri-Counties. Individuals, youth, again, this is still youth, who are identifying as uh, American Indian Alaskan Native. And then the darker bars are anyone who did not identify as AIAN. Um, so, and then we, again, you have eighth grade. So past 30 day, Alcohol use, um, what st stands out to me there is the earlier onset of use, use in the AIAN population. And then by 11th grade, it's a little bit evened out in terms of 30-day uh, uh, alcohol use. This next one is 30-day tobacco use, a similar issue. That what really stands out to me there is the eighth grade. You see this pr pretty big differential, 13% versus 5% of non AIAN and then 11th grade, you still see the differential, but it's a, a little less pronounced. That's for tobacco use. Uh, marijuana use, similar differential between the, the eighth graders and 11th graders now. There's a lot of words on these slides, so I will just try to, to summarize them here. I mean, I think these are concerning slides. It tells us that this population is onsetting use earlier, and we know that that's a risk for con for escalation and also um, use, continued use of other additional substances that can be more harmful to one's health. 
So we, but on the positive side, the data do tell us, the national data do tell us that treatment completion rates are highest among American Indian Alaskan natives and then Asians and then whites. So that if we are able to um, provide access to services and that might be working with tribal entities, uh, they're, they are uh, effective at completing treatment services. However, tribal governments are not as likely to offer MOUD medication for uh, particularly opioid misuse. Um, and I think that's probably all I wanna call out on here, but just in general, this is a disconcerting, we should be, all be concerned about these statistics and uh, be thinking about how we can reach out to populations such as this to, to, to increase our prevention efforts. Youth in foster care, you're gonna see a pattern here. All of the slides I'm gonna show, as you probably would predict, are gonna show the same issue of earlier onset of use and discrepancies across both age ranges, but in part particular with the earlier onset. So for those of you who work with middle schoolers or, or, or even elementary schoolers, I think that this really is, you know, it's a key point of prevention for special populations is to, to help initiate this, the prevention efforts a little bit earlier. Um, and this is tobacco use, same statistics, which, you know, even 11th grade, 29% using tobacco, that was significantly higher than all of this, those slides that I showed earlier. That's a very high, high use. Marijuana use, they're up to 21% at 11th grade for, for 30 day use, use in the last 30 days. Uh, well, that was an abrupt transition. I'm jumping into youth without stable housing. Same general pattern here, although not quite as pronounced, um, but still much higher rates of alcohol use, higher rates of 30-day tobacco use, and higher rates of 30-day marijuana use. So just some take-home points here is that those, those three groups and other underserved groups that I haven't highlighted today um, are, are often showing an earlier onset by sixth or eighth grade, and then continuing to see this discrepancy in frequency and prevalence of use all the way through, through nearly the end of high school. So um, as I mentioned, just the more we can do earlier for special populations or underserved populations, I think we'll get more kind of bang for the prevention buck in that sense. Um, and the reason why I just, you know, from a, I'm, also, I'm trained as a developmental psychologist, so that the other part I want to just chime in here too is that we know substances, especially adolescent brain development is going through just huge amounts of change in terms of the brain connectivity, the way your emotion system connects to your actions, your behavioral systems. Those systems are all refining during adolescence at really pretty phenomenal rates, not seen um, since they were in early childhood, toddlerhood, and prenatally. Um, and we know that substance use um, does have an impact on some of those connections and the way the connectivity is formed that can, can have long-term health consequences into adult. And I, I think I, all of you are likely aware of that, but just I think that's another reason for our work is that this period of adolescence is a particular period of both opportunity and vulnerability in terms of the impact of substances on brain development and the work you all are doing in the space of prevention can, can be really impactful for their lifelong well-being. All right, uh, let's, little bit on service gaps here. This is my sad face slide. <laughs> so this is, there are 50 states. This is how we rank state of Oregon uh, on some really kind of really concerning um, statistics. So we are number one for the percent, this is not just youth now, this is population. We are number one for the percent of population with an illicit drug use disorder in the past year. We are number one for the percent of population needing but not, not receiving substance use, uh, a treatment for a substance use disorder. We are number two for the percent of populations with the substance dis use disorder in the past year. Number two for deaths due to drug use. And number five for the percent of population with an alcohol use disorder in the past year. I don't have anything else to say except for the sad face on that, but this is despite all of the awesome work that many of you in this room are doing. So I, 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 don't, I, I don't mean this to be, hopefully this isn't dis, 
filling people with despair, but we have a lot of work to do. We need more of us out there doing this work. And I'll, this is not the time where we want to be number one. We want to be number 50. So that's my, that's our call for, we need, we need to do more. We need to do, we need more of us out there. Uh, on the, I, th I saw this honestly as kind of positive. So this is, this is complicated here, but what I have here too, that this first row is youth aged 12 to 18 or 12 to 17. The second row is 18 to 25. And then we have substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder, illicit drug use disorder, and it's youth needing but not receiving treatment in Oregon. So if you just look at that 12 to 17 row, the first set of numbers, the first row of numbers, um, you have 8%, for example, with a substance use disorder, and then percent needing but not receiving is 8.2%, and then alcohol use disorder, 3%, and then illicit drug use disorder, 9%. But then when we jump to that 18 to 25, you see those um, needing but not receiving going way up to, you know, almost 30%, 15%, 20%. So honestly, to me, that says those of you working with, <laughs> we're doing a, a much better with these 12 to 17 year olds than we are with the 18 to 25. And so something is, we're falling off somewhere in there. I don't know where that is. Maybe you all have ideas. Uh, but if we could can keep up the work that we're doing with the 12 to 17 year olds and maybe make some more bridges or pathways to, to continuous services help. And I know part of that's challenging because the um, providers of, of services change once you are not a, a child or a minor anymore. Uh, but I cannot, I think we can also think of that as an opportunity. Like what are we doing right with these, the 12 to 17 year olds? Of course, we'd, we'd rather have those numbers be zero, but we're, we're doing a lot worse once they hit 18 to 25. So it's just something to keep in mind, for, especially for those of you working with transition age youth and helping them bridge uh, the next stage of their, of their services. Last set of slides, um, uh, medication for opioid use disorder for youth. And thank you for highlighting some of this already. So I'll be fairly brief here, but um, we know that medication-assisted treatment is effective. We, we also know that BUP is the only medication technically approved for adolescents, 16 and over. Um, but we also know that only one in four tr adolescent treatment facilities are offering it. Um, those facilities are hard to get into and difficult to find ones that specifically offer medication. Yeah, and so, so there, I know there's some sessions this afternoon on stigma, so that maybe this is a time to regroup on that, but I think part of this is, yeah. Is that national data or Oregon? The question is, is the data Oregon or national data? And I'm pretty sure this is Oregon data, but I'm not going to... I am not 100% sure on that. I can't tell from my, I don't have the reference in my notes here, so I will, I'll report back on that later. Thank you. Does it, does that number surprise you? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. The FDA, yeah. Well, my understanding, and I am, I am not an expert on this, so the question is around just sort of this approved, with Butte being the only one approved, uh, because we know that other, uh, and I'll show you on the next slide, other treatments are being used, but they're being used off-label. So um, physicians are able, do use some medications off-label, off but the, F, the FDA has not approved them specifically for youth at this, this age range. So the uh, best way to think of it is like, like when the COVID vaccines um, first came out, or COVID tests even first came out, they were, they were like under experimental, uh, they weren't officially approved, but people were giving them out because it was an emergency. So, emergency. so in emergency situations, they can be used or the things can be used off-label. But strictly by the books, the FDA is the only one who makes the approval, and buprenorphine is the only one that has been approved for adolescents. Uh, so that also makes me think that the data on that last slide were Oregon-based because my next slide is, is about a multi-state study of youth with opioid use disorder. 
Um, and only, uh, so one out of 21 adolescents and one of four young adults were receiving MOUD within three months of diagnosis. Uh, but those who were receiving buprenorphine were 42% less likely to, to, less likely to discontinue their treatment and, and, uh, naltrexone 46% less likely. So, like I said, I think there are cases where other medications are being given, but they're being given because of an emer emer in an emergency use or off-label situation. Uh, and I, I guess I also just want to say, because I am um, a firm believer in sort of behavioral and cognitive therapies and treatments and prevention and family supports too, so I, I'm not, by these slides, I'm not advocating solely for medication. I think there's a place for medication, and it can go really hand-in-hand -hand with a lot of the behavioral and cognitive supports and therapies that, that are used. Um, and this last slide of data here, another chart for you all. So this is, um, this is national data. This is trends 2008 to 17 for opioid use disorder treatment. And so what you see, the, 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 the little tiny black bars are youth age 12 to 17. The middle gray bars are age 18 to 24, and the white ones are age 25 and older. And it show and the graph is showing the um, the pr proportion of those with OUD who are let's see receiving medication. And so basically, once you hit age 25, you're much more likely. Those are the white bars to be able to receive medication for opioid use disorder. And when you're you know 12 to 17, you're in you know two to two to four percent of that group who may need medication for opioid use disorder is is receiving it. Okay, uh, I think that was my last slide. Uh, I wanted to thank Avery Turner, who's a, a um, also identifies as American Indian. She's a PhD student working with me, and she really helped me pull together these slides. She's not here today, but I wanted to make sure to give her partial credit for this this work. Thank you, and I can, do I have, a few, I do have a few minutes for questions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to respond to someone who asked about the student health data. Yeah. And if you can break it down by race, ethnicity. There is a dashboard or a data portal for the Oregon Student Health Survey data, and you can do cross tabulations. Um, so you could look at substance use and then do a cross tab with race or gender if you wanted to. but there's likely going to be suppression just because the data may be too small to reveal the number. Um, yeah. But I wanted to make sure people That's knew great. about that. Thank yeah. you for, I'm really glad you chimed in about that. So it's an interactive system. You can go in there and manipulate yourself and that your point is well taken. A lot of times if there's not enough uh, people in one group, you the data won't get pulled because it could be identifying. I also wanted to let folks know that in this last legislative session, there was a bill passed um, that is now requiring the student health survey to be administered. Um, you know, there's still the opt out for parents if they want to. But right. yeah, that's that's great to hear for our next round of data that Portland Public Schools will have to administer the survey. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for your att great attention to all of the that data that I showed there. I really appreciate it. I know that was heavy, but hopefully set the stage for some of the awesome uh, presenters and conversations for the rest of today. Thanks.